thumbs up one. All right, I think we're live. So we would like to welcome everybody to this virtual tour and presentation. And my name is Rachel Serkin and I'm the manager of school programs at the museum at Eldridge Street. Hi everyone, my name is Katie Vogel. I work as the public historian at the Henry Street Settlement. And I'll tell you more about Henry Street later as we go. But for now, um, just to give you a little bit of a sense of the organization, it's what's called a social services agency. And that means that we help the community in a variety of different ways. Um, we have shelters for people who are homeless. We have daycare, we have after school programs, we have college counseling programs for senior citizens, and the list goes on and on and on. And we have a very long history in the neighborhood of the Lower East Side. So I'll be telling you about that in a little while. And I'm going to be giving you more of a history of the museum at Eldridge Street and the community who built it and worshiped there. Um, but Katie and I are colleagues that work um, at two institutions that have these very deep roots in the neighborhood of the Lower East Side. Um, and also there's a very special and long history of community supporting each other. Mm -hmm. um, and just in, as we start going into this tour together, I have a prompt. And this is something, you know, you can write a response down to this, just something for you to think about, to keep in the back of your mind. Um, and during this presentation, we want you to think about a time when maybe you needed help or support and who or where did you turn to? And in what ways did that person or place help you? Um, and I think especially as we think about the things that are happening in the world today um, and here in the US and in our city, um, it's really important for all of us to have people and places to turn to. Um, and I know for me personally, um, I've always looked to my parents or teachers when I needed, when I needed support or advice. And Katie, what about you? They're a place or person. I would say that it's it's the same for me. Um, growing up, definitely teachers, number yeah. one, and and family and and friends. Yeah, I think those are the top ones for me as well. Yeah. Um, and for Katie and I, we work at institutions that have these very long histories and ties to immigration. And Katie had already mentioned that we're in a neighborhood called the Lower East Side. And maybe for some of you that's a neighborhood you've heard of or maybe you visited before. Um, but I'm just going to pull up a map here. So you can actually physically see where the Lower East Side is. Um, so all the streets that are inside the big yellow bold lines, that's the neighborhood of the Lower East Side, which is in Lower Manhattan. Um, so you can see on the map, there's the Manhattan Bridge and the East River. So this is our historical neighborhood. Um, and this neighborhood is hundreds of years old. Um, it's one of the oldest neighborhoods in New York City. And people still to this day call it a gateway to America. And maybe that's a term maybe you've heard in school or in books that you've read before. And we call it a gateway because for millions of immigrants, for, for people coming from different countries um, to the United States, this is often maybe the first neighborhood they would pass through on their journey in this country. Um, and it's still very much a gateway to America today. Um, many different immigrant communities live here. Um, and one of the things I love about the Lower East Side is we've had these different waves of immigration. Um, I had a colleague um, who, when she would speak about it to her students, she would ask them to think about going to the beach and you picture the shoreline and the waves come into the beach and then they pull back and they always leave things like glass or seashells. There's always things left behind. And that's like the Lower East Side. Waves of immigrants have come through our neighborhood and they might pass through over time, uh, but they leave remnants of their community behind for the next wave. And the story of our, our institutions um, takes place in the late 1800s. Um, so during this time in history, um, the United States is experiencing what we call a second wave of immigration. Um, and this is the period between 1880 and 1924. Um, and during this period of time, over 36 million immigrants um, make the crossing over to the US. 
And specifically uh, for us at the museum at Eldridge Street, we focus on the Jewish immigrant experience, uh, particularly Jews coming from countries in Eastern Europe, places like Russia and Poland. Um, and about two and a half million of these immigrants made the crossing over during this time. And over two million of them settle in this tiny little neighborhood. Um, and if you think even about, you know, whether you're some, an immigrant from 100 years ago or an immigrant coming over today, you're going to have a lot of questions. Um, and also a question I want to pose to all of you to think about. Oh, one second there. Um, so speaking of actual ways before I get to my question. Um, this is, you know, literally a wave of immigration we're seeing right here. Um, this is a photograph of the SS Patricia and everybody on this boat um, is an immigrant. Um, they gathered on the deck of the ship because when the ship pulled into New York City into the harbor, uh, they were looking at something, um, maybe something that you've seen before visited. So I'll give you a moment, you can guess what it is. And maybe if some of you guessed right, that's the Statue of Liberty that they were looking at. So for first glimpse of the United States right there. So getting to the question I wanted to ask, when a person or family leave their home country to come to a new country, what types of support do they need? And this might be a question maybe in your own family history or your own experience. Like what are things that you're going to need when you arrive to a new place? It could be housing, it could be a job, it could be finding food from your home country. So all kinds of things. Learning a new language as well. Learning a new language, so where are you going to go to school? So it's gonna be really important to, when you find a community to find the places where they can, you can be supported. And for Eastern European Jews, a lot of them came to the Lower East Side because there was this Jewish community there. Um, and it looked like this. So this is a photograph of Orchard and Hester Street. Uh, literally from where, where I work, this is like just around the corner from where I am. Um, the, the street has changed a lot in the course of a hundred years. Um, but when this picture was taken in 1898, this part of the Lower East Side was known as the Jewish Lower East Side. Um, and it's packed with people. Um, you can see people shopping in the street. Um, they're operating what are called push carts, so they're doing business. And if you look carefully at some of the signs, you're gonna notice lots of different languages. Um, so like what Katie was saying with like language, that's really important. Finding people that share your traditions and your language and your culture. Um, so for Jewish immigrants, they could find many of these things here in the neighborhood. Um, and there was lots of local support. So just to like give you two of them. Um, so for example, uh, Eastern European Jews, when they arrived, they spoke a language called Yiddish, um, which is a language of German and Hebrew. And here they could access newspapers in their native language. So this picture on the top right is from a headline. Um, and in Yiddish, it translates to a bintel brief, um, which was a Yiddish advice column in a newspaper called the Jewish Daily Forward. Um, so the Forward was a very popular newspaper at the time where immigrants could write into the editors um, and ask all kinds of questions about how to navigate life and work and ro romantic relationships here in America. So for this immigrant community, they turned to newspapers for information and support. And another place here at the bottom, this is the top of a building uh, just around the corner from our museum called the Kletzker Brotherly Aid Association. Um, and oftentimes when immigrants come over, you're coming from a town or a city or a village, and chances are likely that there are people from your community that are already here. So they form these what are called mutual aid societies. And you could go to your mutual aid society and meet people from your hometown that share these, the shared history with you and connections. Um, and they could even offer financial support to you. Um, so there were hundreds of these aid societies here in the neighborhood. A third place you could go is a synagogue. And that's where the story of our museum comes into play. 
And for Jewish immigrants, one of the biggest reasons they came over to the United States was because they were looking for religious freedom. Um, it was very difficult for them to be Jewish in their native countries. And there were many laws and limitations simply because they were of the Jewish faith. Um, so this immigrant community was really attracted to the idea of being able to openly worship and not only openly worship, but to build places of worship that were grand, um, almost in the sense that you could be proud of your religion. And that's where our story comes into play. Um, so today we're called the Museum at Eldridge Street. Uh, we're a nonprofit, non-sectarian organization, um, but our museum is housed with inside this building you're seeing, which is the Eldridge Street Synagogue. And the Eldridge Street Synagogue was built in 1887. Um, so if you're a mental mathematician, you know, you can, I mean, I, I give, I kind of give you the, the answer right there, but thinking about 132 years ago, um, this is before the time of the internet or cars or electricity. Um, another way to think about it is your grandparents probably haven't been born yet. Um, and New York City, as we know it today, we've got Brooklyn and Bronx and Queens. There, there's no such thing as New York City as we know it today. So very different place. And this is not the oldest synagogue in New York City or even the United States. Um, Jewish immigrants have been a part of this nation's history since before the nation was founded. But for this community, it was really special because as you look at the building, you might be noticing how big it is. Um, and also all these circular windows. You can see here this round window. This is what's called a rose window. And at the top of the building, you can see five what are called minarets. And at the tippy top, um, there's something called a finial, uh, which is a, in the shape of a Star of David. This building was really fancy. Um, and there was really nothing quite like it here in the neighborhood. And it wasn't just a place where immigrants could go and be in a beautiful setting. Um, this building provided a lot of different kinds of support and services. So what we're going to do, we're going to go imagine we're walking through the gates, um, through the grand doors of the synagogue. And I'm going to take you inside our main sanctuary. You can take a moment just to look at the details. So where we're looking right now, so we're standing in the back of our main sanctuary. Um, our synagogue has three levels. Um, there's a basement level, um, there's the main sanctuary level, and then you can see at the top there's a balcony. Um, and in this synagogue, the men and women would sit separately from each other with the women in the balcony. Um, but often when people are, came into this building for the first time, they were just stunned by the grandeur and the beauty of this place. Um, and also the use of all the stained glass windows we see here. So Katie's gonna talk more about this during her presentation, but for a lot of families, remember there was no electricity in the building, in their homes. Um, so people literally lived and worked in the dark. So when you came in here, there was all this incredible stained glass and you can see the chandelier here. Um, this space was very brightly lit. And what I'll do, just give us another vantage point. So what you're looking at here is a view from the women's balcony facing towards the eastern direction. So when this synagogue was designed, they really wanted it to be a place where people can come and can enjoy the beauty and the kind of the majestic, you know, the majesty of the space. Um, and considering that people lived and worked in such a busy, unsanitary neighborhood, this was kind of a respite. It was a break from the outside world. Show one more image. And this one's at nighttime. Um, so this is the uh, western part of the synagogue. So this is so this window you're looking at. That's the same window you just saw when it was we were facing the street level. Um, so we have that view there. Turn the slide. And 
And these are some images just of the different types of stained glass we have here in the building. Um, so there are 67 stained glass windows in the sanctuary. Um, and there are all of these incredible patterns with geometric shapes. Um, you also see the Star of David um, everywhere here in our building because again, they were very proud of their Jewish identity. So they really wanted to show that off. Um, and getting back to the lighting for a moment, you can see here an image of our historic chandelier. Um, so when this was built, our synagogue was lit by gaslight, which a lot of people still didn't have in the neighborhood. And maybe if, if you've never seen gaslight before, um, there are these um, glass shades or globes and there's a little knob and you turn the knob and it makes the flame brighter or dimmer. Um, but by 1907, this congregation was doing so well financially, they were able to afford electric light. Um, and that was just an incredible thing to behold uh, because people still didn't have electricity in their home. And we even have a story um, of a congregant um, in the 1920s who remembers people coming to the synagogue simply to look at the light bulbs because it was just such a modern phenomena to have. Um, so in a lot of ways, this building was just providing a peaceful, beautiful place for immigrants to come um, away from their homes and the, the factories they worked in. But they also did more. Um, this wasn't just a beautiful building. Um, it was also built on the premise that it took a community to make this possible. Um, so two images you're looking at here. On my left, you're looking at the, the seats in the synagogue. Um, and these are the original historic pews. Um, one of the things you're probably noticing is the numbers on the seats. Um, and if anyone here has ever been to a sporting event or a theater before, do they ever just let you sit in the front, the VIP section at the Yankee game or front row seats at the theater? Unfortunately, no, you've got to pay for it. Um, and not only did the synagogue have assigned seating, um, they had what's called, what we might call membership today. And instead of memberships, people would pay dues. And dues could be X amount of money. So if you look at the number 39 here, that might mean you're paying a lot more money than seat number 71. Um, and people had options to buy or rent their seats, but these dues were really important because that was the money being put into this building, uh, not only to sustain it, but to provide services to the community, um, to provide what, what we call in Hebrew, sedaka. And that brings me to the image next to it. Um, sedaka you might, is a word maybe if we've heard of, we think of it as charity. Um, in Hebrew, it means justice. Um, and sadaka is a really important value in the Jewish community, um, giving money back to many causes. And in the synagogue, they encourage their congregants to contribute to the sadaka. And what this is, a picture of, this is our original uh, iron sadaka box. Um, and you'll notice the writing here. Um, there are a total of six slots on this charity box, and each slot represents a different charity you can give to. So for example, on Monday, if you have some money, you might decide you want to give some money to help um, a Hebrew school or yeshiva in the neighborhood. But maybe on Wednesday, you're going to give money to help with the repair of prayer books. So every day of the week, you had the option to help a different cause. Um, the synagogue also had a board. They had a method and the board kept meeting minutes. They had meetings together where they decided um, who in the community maybe is having a tough time. Um, so we can give some money to support them. Maybe somebody in the community passed away and there isn't money for the burial. The synagogue would take care of those things. If the person died and they left behind a widow or children, the family would be taken care of. Um, so it's really important when we talk about these buildings. You can have a beautiful synagogue, but it's really the people inside that, that, make, it, that make it thrive, that make, that make it matter. And this was a communal organization for many, many years. It thrived for decades here on the east side. Uh, but as time went on, the neighborhood has changed. And a lot of the Jewish immigrants and their families started to move out of the neighborhood, going to other parts of New York City. 
Um, and by the 1920s, um, immigration law had also changed in this country. So it wasn't so easy anymore to come over if you were from these Eastern European countries. So with all this happening, the number of congregants in the synagogue began to dwindle. Um, so as more people left, uh, there wasn't the money anymore to really sustain this building or sustain these causes. And it did get to a point where the remaining congregants locked up the main sanctuary. Uh, they moved into the basement and they didn't come upstairs for over 20 years. Um, so the way I always think about this, like if you're maybe in your bedroom right now or like in your house, just think about your bedroom and your furniture and your toys and you know all, the, all your possessions and imagine locking your bedroom up and not going inside for 20 years. I'm sure you can imagine that is like an incredible amount of dust um, or what I like to call New York City wildlife. Um, and we found all these things in the building. So here are some pictures I'll show you. Um, in the 1970s, it was actually a history teacher um, named Gerard Wolf who rediscovered this building. And you're seeing the picture on the left is the women's balcony. And this represents the condition our building was found in. So just peeling paint and water damage. Um, our stained glass windows were broken. We had, you know, pigeons living and flying around the women's balcony. Um, our building was really dilapidated. Um, it was on the verge of collapse. And this is a picture here of our, the dome, the main dome in our ceiling. So just again, looking at the detail to the water damage that was here. Um, Gerard Wolf called this building an American ruin. Um, I think that was a really interesting choice of words. Um, this building was not even a hundred years old and it had fallen into terrible disrepair. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but, you know, thankfully there was a community um, in our, the Lower East Side and across the nation and the city that felt that this building was worth saving it was worth protecting, um, that it had a part to play in the story of the Lower East Side community. And in 1987, we started our organization, though at the time we were not a museum, we were called the Eldridge Street Project. And the goal of our project was to do two things, um, to get this building landmarked and protected so that it will never be torn down. And then the second more ambitious thing was, could we raise enough money to bring this building back to the way it once looked? Um, so the short answer is, as you've seen, is yes, we were able to do that. Uh, but it took our organization over 20 years um, to, and $20 million in fundraising to do. Um, People will always ask, like, when did your restoration finish? Um, technically, we say 2007, um, but I always, you know, add um, this restoration will never be finished. Um, it's an old building, and our role today as the museum is to protect and take care of this building. Uh, one last thing that we did do, though, and you might have noticed in the other slides, this incredible blue stained glass window. Um, this piece is something new. Um, the window to the left are these glass blocks in the shape of tablets. Um, that is not original to the building. That was a window that came in later, um, probably because the original rose window had broken. Um, so the congregation needed to replace it with something. Um, in 2010, we decided to create something new in this building to represent the, the new chapter, the rebirth of this building story. And we worked with an artist named Kiki Smith, who is a contemporary artist. Um, and she worked with an architect named Deborah Gans to build this window. Um, and one of the reasons the design was chosen is because it also reflects the incredible motif of the blue and gold stars we have here in the building. So in our synagogue today, we have this juxtaposition of the old and new. Um, and our building today is not just for Jewish people or, you know, for the descendants of the immigrants that lived here. It's a building really for everybody. And this last image I have here is our block um, as it looks today. Um, and if you look carefully, you know, think about the picture you saw of Hester Street in the 1890s. 
Um, if you take a walk to Eldridge Street or parts of the Lower East Side today, you're going to see a lot more signage in Chinese or hear Spanish being spoken. Um, because again, as we've said, this is a gateway to America still for immigrants today. Um, and this new wave of immigrants are living on the block and in these old tenement buildings. They're setting up businesses and houses of worship. Um, and we're here on that block. So with, we can really tell the story of immigration just through a single city block here in New York. And as a museum, part of our job is to not just preserve the story of this building, but to celebrate the Lower East Side. Um, so throughout the year, um, if, and now that we, even though we are currently not open, we're doing a lot of these programs virtually. Uh, we do tours, we do walking tours of the neighborhood, family programs, concerts. Um, and every year um, we have celebrated this very special block party where this street is closed off and we open up the building to the public and we have one of the biggest block parties in New York City. Um, and it's a very special festival called the Egg Rolls, Egg Creams and Empanada Festival. Um, and these three foods uh, represent the Jewish, Chinese and the Puerto Rican community that have made the Lower East Side home. Um, so we really see ourselves today as partners um, in this community. And so speaking of partnership, um, I am going to hand you guys over now to Katie. Um, we're going to go a few blocks further east over to Henry Street. Great. Thank you, Rachel. So this is a picture of three townhouse buildings and then an old firehouse building on Henry Street which as Rachel said, is just a few blocks from Museum at Eldridge. It's about a 15 minute walk or so. Um, so this is the headquarters of Henry Street Settlement and has been our headquarters since the very beginning. And it was the home of our founder, Lillian Wald as well. So I'm gonna spend some time telling you about Lillian Wald. She's really an amazing figure with amazing history and had such a huge impact on the Lower East Side neighborhood, but also her ideas expanded internationally and, um, and had such an effect on this country as a whole as well. So she's really an undersung hero in a lot of ways. I think some people who grew up on the Lower East Side or in New York might know her name, but um, she really should be more well known with the impact that she had. So I'm gonna be telling you about Lillian Wald. Um, you can actually go back for just a second, Rachel. Um, I'm going to be telling you about Lillian Wald and about Henry Street's founding in 1893. So a lot about our history, which is, again, at the same time that muse at the um, Museum at Eldridge or the synagogue was built. So same community, right? It was mostly an immigrant community from Eastern Europe, um, mostly a Jewish community on the Lower East Side. And I'll be telling you about the, the founding of our organization and how we were set up as this place to serve the community and to help the community. So Lillian Wald, you see her pictured here in her nursing uniform. She was not from New York City. She was actually born in Ohio and then raised in Rochester, New York. And then she moved to New York City to go to nursing school. And so this is a picture of her when she's in her early 20s, graduating from nursing school. And then after she graduated, she actually went to medical school. She went to the Women's Medical College, but she didn't finish because she decided to start Henry Street Settlement. And it actually all started with one person who lived in the Lower East Side neighborhood. It was a little girl who was about seven years old. And she interrupted a class that Lillian Wald was teaching to immigrant mothers in the neighborhood, a wellness class. And she let Lillian Wald know that her mother lived close by, her family lived close by, and her mother was dying because she had just given birth, she was hemorrhaging after childbirth, and the doctor who was caring for the family had just left because they couldn't continue to pay their medical bills. So Lillian Wald followed this little girl through the streets of the neighborhood. And as Rachel was saying, this area was the most crowded neighborhood in the world. She's following this girl through the streets up to Ludlow Street. It was a rainy March morning when this happened. And she follows her inside of their apartment building, their tenement building. 
and heads upstairs with this little girl and into their family's home. And she sees inside this home a very crowded space with about 10 people living in the apartment. In many of these apartments, these tenement apartments in the neighborhood, these buildings did not have running water inside, did not have toilets inside, did not have light, definitely not electricity, but some of these buildings didn't even have gas lighting yet. So just using candles and oil lamps, so very dark spaces, very overcrowded because many of these families didn't have very much money. So you might have to live with a lot of family members or have people live with you to help you pay for the rent. What you see in this picture is inside of a tenement building and inside of a tenement apartment and it's showing work taking place in the home, right? So a family making garments. That was one of the main industries that new immigrants were working in when they came to the United States. And so Lillian Wald was witnessing all of this, um, the conditions of this, this one family's home. And she really, she was shocked by it. She calls this moment for her when she was, she was older, she calls it very naive that she didn't know that this was taking place and these kind of conditions existed for poor families. But she calls this moment that she has a baptism of fire. And what that meant for her is that she really woke up, right? She, she now had seen these conditions up close. She knew that people were um, living in homes without water and without bathrooms and without light and air, and that these spaces were so crowded. And she nursed this person who was dying back to health. And again, she realized that, you know, someone can be just left to die just because they don't have money, right? So she decides to change her course. And she, instead of continuing in academics and medical school, she moves to the Lower East Side neighborhood and she starts a nursing service. So this is a picture of Henry Street nurses on a stoop in the Lower East Side. They're carrying their bags and going inside of people's homes to take care of them. Lillian Wald is hiring eventually hundreds of nurses and they're going all over the neighborhood and eventually all over the city to take care of people inside of their homes. They did also set up a clinic at Henry Street in the headquarters, but really the idea was that they were visiting nurses because Lillian Wald estimated that about 90% of people who were sick just stayed at home sick. Mm -hmm. And that was for lots of different reasons that people just stayed at home sick. They maybe didn't have enough money. Maybe they didn't have transportation to get to a doctor or a hospital. Maybe they didn't want to go to a hospital because a lot of the hospitals were operated by religious organizations. And so if they, especially, you know, as a Jewish family, going to a um, Christian hospital, you might get preached to. And also fear of stigma, right? and maybe the language barrier too. So all of these things um, resulted in families who were sick just staying at home sick. So the visiting nurses would go to the people and they actually weren't from the neighborhood. So, or many of them weren't. So they had to get to know the neighborhood and they'd go around to talk to religious leaders and to owners of buildings and janitors of buildings and people who own stores in the Lower East Side and push cart peddlers, and they just talked to the community and tried to really learn the community. They didn't want to come to the Lower East Side with this top-down approach and say, you know, we know what's best for you. They wanted to really be there to serve the community. And that's actually, that's the idea that we still have as an organization today, is that we want to really listen to what people need instead of just, you know, thinking that we have all the answers, right? So, um, these visiting nurses treated their patients with dignity and respect, no matter what their situations were or if they didn't have money, right? That's how they were trained. That's how they approached their patients. So, oh, this is, this is one of my favorite photos of a visiting nurse crossing over a tenement rooftop to get to the next building. And the idea was that this was the most efficient way to reach your patients is 
um, you know, they're not going to go down to the street and go back up. They're reaching their patients at any length and as quick as possible. These are two women who were the first two African American nurses who were hired by Henry Street, Elizabeth Tyler and Edith Carter. And they started a whole nother branch of the visiting nurses service in a neighborhood called San Juan Hill, which no longer exists today, but it used to be in Midtown West, right above Times Square area, right where Lincoln Center is. And in the early 1900s, that area of the city had the city's largest black population, African Americans and immigrants of African descent. And there were a lot of similar public health issues in that area, right? So as the Lower East Side was very crowded, right? And people didn't have access to water and um, not, didn't have access to medical care. People are getting sick at a much faster rate than in neighborhoods where people had money, right? Those areas were less crowded. People were able to go to the doctor. So the Lower East Side had a lot of those issues and same with this area, San Juan Hill. This is a picture of the branch of, that, of Henry Street that they started in San Juan Hill. It was called the Stillman House branch. Of all the little babies. I know, it's a great photo. So back to a picture of our headquarters. This is the building, especially that center building to the left, that's 265 Henry Street. That was Lillian Wald's home. And that's where the, a lot of the nurses lived in the early years. And that's um, the headquarters, right? That's the main, um, the main home of Henry Street. And it still is today. And so out of that building, operated the clinic and then classes and clubs as well. So we weren't just doing medical care. From the very beginning, um, Henry Street was also serving the community in a variety of different ways. So um, all different kinds of classes. This is showing a library within that building at 265 Henry Street. I showed you a picture of the inside of the tenements and those spaces were so crowded and didn't have light and there was work going on in those in many of the homes. And so this was a quiet place for kids to be able to go to Henry Street to work. And there were attendants on site that could help with homework as well. And so all different kinds of programs like this of, um, you know, clubs and classes, English classes, cooking classes, dancing classes, the list just goes on and on. This is a picture of a, a dance class. Um, there were all kinds of theater and arts classes, visual art, music. And this was a part of Henry Street's programs from the very beginning, which when I heard that for the first time, I was kind of surprised. They're doing this medical care and visiting nursing, um, but also had arts classes from the very beginning. Lillian Wald, it was part of her larger idea around health and wellness that every person should be able to have access to being creative, um, that this is part of being a full person. And you shouldn't just have to have money in order to be able to access the arts. So she started all kinds of art classes that people could, could come to. And her, I told you before that her ideas were extending beyond the Lower East Side. She starts in New York City the school lunch program and places nurses inside of public schools in New York. So these two things, the school lunch program and nurses being in schools, these are something, these are things that are so common now um, across cities in the United States. And something that's part of our daily lives that maybe we don't even think about how these programs started. But for both of these programs, um, Lillian Wald was, witnessing in her own community that kids were going to school hungry and then weren't able to learn or were going to school with a minor sickness and then were told to leave school and would fall way behind in their studies. So she, she got the city to start a lunch program in all the schools in the five boroughs where kids could actually eat on site at school, um, either for free or at an affordable price. And even just to say too, thinking about like school lunch, if you don't have anything to eat at school, like how can you possibly, how can you possibly focus? 
on your school, your education. Yeah. And along similar lines that, um, that you know, everyone should have access to um, have food at school or to have access to the arts, even if you don't have money, Lillian Wild also thought that every kid should be able to have space and to be able to play, even if they were also helping their families, um, even helping their families to work. Right? You saw that workspace in the home. Kids were also working to help their families make money. Kids today sometimes are helping their families in a variety of ways as well. Um, then there were no such things as what were called ch child labor laws, right? Um, so kids were working in factories. Um, Lillian Wald actually is one of the people who pushed to um, get child labor laws instituted so that kids um, were not working, right, and that they could have a full childhood and go to school. But so she started a playground in her backyard behind the headquarters of Henry Street, and it was so popular that she advocated to New York City government to build playgrounds in low-income neighborhoods all over the city. And so this is a picture of Seward Park, which is just, it's actually right in the middle of where Museum at Eldridge Street is and Henry Street. And it is the first city built playground in the whole United States. And it was actually started by Lillian Wald and then the city took over it. So it's, it's kind of amazing that a, a nurse started the first playground, right? But again, it's around that idea of a very holistic view of health and wellness. So she is providing services to her direct community, right? And also starting programs around the city, but she didn't think it was enough to just provide services. And so she thought it was very important to, to fight for a change on a larger level through laws, right? So this is showing a peace parade in 1914 um, for, in World War I, but um, she was involved in all kinds of activism work. She was involved in the women's suffrage movement to get women the right to vote in the early 1900s. And she fought for the rights of immigrants and African-Americans. She was actually a um, co-founder of a major civil rights organization from the early 1900s it's called the NAACP. It still exists today. And she did this work with the other women who helped her start Henry Street Settlement. And she actually calls these people her family. And these people were her lifelong friends and her partners in this work. And she really couldn't have done this work without, without these people. And some of these people actually lived on site at Henry Street as well. That um, I mentioned that we're called Henry Street Settlement, right? That word settlement refers to actually people settling into a neighborhood and becoming part of that neighborhood so that they can better serve the community, right? So these are the people she really worked with. And Henry Street started to become in known internationally, right? So I just wanna share a few people who visited Henry Street who you may be familiar with, with their names. Eleanor Roosevelt came in 1930, and it says next to her name in a guest book that she signed. So this is up at the top line there. In very faint pencil, it's kind of hard to see, but she wrote Governor's Wife. Um, her, her husband was Franklin D. Roosevelt, and he was the governor of New York, and he later became the president of the United States. Um, during, especially during the Great Depression, a lot of people know him for that work. But she did so much work on her own as well. And her work on the Lower East Side and working with and at settlement houses really helped to inform um, Franklin D. Roosevelt's work as governor and then as president. And Rosa Parks, probably our most famous visitor to Henry Street. Um, she came in 1956, and also a, another civil rights leader, um, Septima Clark, 
came to Henry Street as well. So Rosa Parks is the person in this photo on the right, Septima Clark is on the left. And you'll see at the top of um, the guest book there, the signature of Rosa Parks. She checked into Henry Street to stay on site and stay, stay at the settlement May 13th to May 25th. And this is right after the bus boycotts in Montgomery, Alabama. So she's known for um, being the person who really starts those bus boycotts by refusing to give up her seat. She was a trained activist and she came to Henry Street to exchange ideas um, during the civil rights movement. So that's actually a little after Lillian Wald's time. She was no longer alive by that time. And just the last picture of Lillian Wald. Um, she really is a personal hero of mine. And although I've been working at the, at the Henry Street Settlement now for about three years, it's just, it keeps unfolding how, how much of, of an impact she had on her community and all the different programs that she started and her activism work. I just continue to be blown away by, by her work and inspired by her work. And our director of Henry Street Settlement today um, really holds her up as a light too for the work that he's doing now because we're still an active organization. We don't have a visiting nurses service anymore um, that split off and became something separate later, but we still are doing a lot of those same programs that I talked about in this talk today and we're serving the community um, through, through so many different changes, right? And this is, um, this is a really hard time for our neighbors right now during the COVID crisis. And so, um, you know, we've started a food pantry and started a helpline so that community members can call in and um, get directed to help. So we're continuing, continuing that work today. It hasn't, we're not just a historic site, right? We're still doing that work in the present day. If you all have any questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. So we're gonna give you our contact information. And also I just wanna bring up again what Katie had mentioned with Henry Street and their COVID Help 19 helpline um, and just like people helping people in the community. Um, um, so I think it's really important with these two institutions, you know, we're still finding ways to provide support and help to our community. Um, with our Henry Street's doing its incredible work with the social services that it provides. And for us at the museum at Eldridge Street, um, uh, we are still currently closed. Uh, we cannot wait to reopen and welcome you all to the museum in person for tours and programs. But if you do go on our website, which is provided here, and here's my telephone number as well, uh, we do have a very full calendar of virtual programs and events, um, and many of them there's no charge to participate in them. Uh, so the best way to learn about those events is through the museum's website. And you know we welcome you uh, for our programs. And Katie and I both look forward to when we can reopen uh, for visits again to our institutions. Yes. Um I, just as Rachel said, I also invite you after um, we're, we're able to reopen. Many of our Henry Street programs are still open, um, but our museum at our headquarters is not open right now. So once we're back, I would love to give you a tour in person or your class or your family. Um, so my email is kvogel, V-O-G-E-L, at henrystreet.org. And also below my contact information is the number for the, um, for the Henry Street helpline. So if you or someone in your community might need extra help right now, um, this is a number you can give them. Yes. And my email, if you have any questions or want to know more information, is rcirkin, that's S-E-R-K-I-N, at Eldridge Street, E L D R I D G E S T R E E T dot org. And our website, just simply look up Eldridge Street dot org, um, and our information is there. Um, and we want to thank you all for watching this video and participating today. And we look forward to hearing from you and seeing you soon. Thank you so much for coming.